<laughs> Amazing. Hey, Dad. I love it. <laughs> Is this performance art? <laughs>good how are things going things are things are pretty good things are good how are you guys doing pretty good uh nice to meet you virtually i don't think we've have we met in person yet i'm sure we have i've seen you perform but in person yeah at seamus oh no. maybe seamus yeah i was like was it splice or seamus one of those it was One. at Seamus. It was the the at the bar. That was. Uh, but it was packed with people, so I'm not sure I actually met you. That was a that was a show for the books. That was a crazy one. It was very loud. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that too. Was it you, me, Scott, and Adam Z? Adam. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, that's crazy. I feel I I. I would be amazed if we haven't met in person. That would be a weird uh, ships in the night thing, but I just it thought happens. It seemed well, nice to, you know, be with you now. You too. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, totally. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, maybe a good place to start then, Ted, would be um, over the last 10 years or so that I've known you, I think, correct me if I'm wrong here, but... I feel like I have known you to identify yourself as an electroacoustic composer and a laptopist and lately an electronicist. So I'm wondering if you could trace maybe the outline of how of what those are specifically to you and how you got from one to the other. Sure. Um yeah, so uh, I mean I started as a composer, started composing first and then um you know, was really attracted to electronic music and computer music and the sound possibilities that it offered. Um, so I kind of quite quickly went into that and became an electroacoustic composer by which, you know, there's electricity involved is the most basic way I, I just sometimes answer that. Uh, but you know, there's usually some sort of electronic sound being produced through speakers uh, as part of the performance. And there's also probably an acoustic part uh, of the performance. So a live um, instrumentalist playing alongside the electronic sounds, electroacoustic music. Um, and then as an improviser or, or a laptopist or an electronicist, um, yeah, so I perform using those tools in real time. Uh, again, usually there's electricity involved is like the most basic way to sort of make some delineation. Um, but it could be synthesizer sounds or live processing sounds or like feedback sounds, um, but that I'm performing them in real time as an instrument where I'm manipulating some set of controls that are changing how those sounds are sounding. Um, and sometimes that's happening in a compositional setting where I'm sort of executing a part as a, as a instrument in the performance. And more often lately it's, um, as an improviser. So I'm using those instruments and tools and performing with them uh, in, in, in an improvisatory setting, usually with other performers uh, that I'm improvising with. Those are outlines. That wasn't how I came to them. Do you want me to try to answer that too? Yeah. Well, the, for, the, for the improvising, um, I mean, I think it really started, this would have been many years ago now, uh, when I first saw Sam Pluta and Peter Evans play together, and I was just like, wow, that's a thing, that's amazing. Um, and at that point, I had already been doing a lot with computer music and sort of creating electronic sounds as part of my artistic process and practice. And uh, the idea was like, I wonder if doing that in real time and improvising is something that I would find exciting and interesting. So I just started poking around down that path. Um, I uh, had some conversations with Sam actually, and like read his dissertation, which sort of outlined some of his 
um, technical thinking around how to execute that sort of a activity. And started putting some of those tools together, um, first in pure data, and then in super collider. And, um, and then there came a point where, you know, th that was sort of like an interesting path for me to pursue. Like, oh, I wonder if this is something I could be doing. And so then there came a point when it was like, hey, I think I should try this. Like, let's do it. So I actually called Kyle and was like, hey, do you want to come into my living room and we'll just like go and see what happens. Um, and then, you know, I guess the rest is history. There's definitely like uh, sort of more development in that practice that has happened over many years about how I think about things and how I execute things. And um, so there's more to be had there. But I mean, that was the basic outline of getting to that point messing around and then just like getting a friend in the room being like, let's see if it works. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the, like developing your software and the evolution of that and how that's sort of developed over time? I, I watched some of your presentations on expressivity through um, the creating software that, that, um, that allows for optimal expression. And I'm just curious how, your, the software has evolved or your approach to it has evolved technically, but also um, like philosophically, artistically. Yeah. Um, so the, the, like I said, the basis of it was actually Sam's dissertation. And the, the main like paradigm that I took from that was basically the plumbing of how audio gets routed to different places inside of the software. Um, and that's still implemented in the same way today because uh, it's, a, it's a really good design. Um, and, and then sort of the, 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 the real realization that I had at some point was that, you know, I mean, I still am exploring timbre and thinking of new sounds to include in my software, but the real sort of expressivity and places of innovation that I find most rewarding are the control strategies. So how do I actually control the parameters that are generating the sound. Um, and so I've designed the software to be really flexible in how the control actually happens. So each like synthesizer or whatever in the software has, you know, anywhere from two to 10 or more um, like controls in them. They might be buttons or sliders or toggles are like the, the main three control types. Um, and then I can very quickly and easily assign any of those control devices to any uh, controls that are in front of me. So I have like MIDI controllers and an iPad that's sending OSC messages, and then also the computer keyboard, uh, which is like a whole bunch of buttons, which is really useful for hitting buttons. Um, and so it's sort of the relation between mapping the physical controllers that I have here onto the software controllers that are in the software and how that mapping happens um, and how that mapping is able to create different types of expressivity and, you know, different types of gesture and um, timbral combinations and um, sort of the speed and uh, accuracy with which I'm able to make sonic jumps or relations to different parts of the software and different sounds that are embedded in there. So that control interface is really the thing that I um, have thought a lot about and have really worked on implementing in ways that feel musically expressive to me. That's, yeah, the most, the biggest area of development. And now I'm actually working with machine learning algorithms and tools to further explore sort of strategies of control um, when I'm improvising, you know, I could have any, I, I have these controllers in front of me and there could be 50 or more, uh, you know, control parameters at my fingertips, but I only have so many fingers. So thinking about how to use these different machine learning algorithms to, uh, be able to sort of swoop through and access more, um, sonic spaces more quickly than having to, you know, adjust these 30 parameters to like get to that new space. What if I could just go and get to that new space? Um, so that's sort of where that thinking is at now is looking at using those tools to 
augment that sort of um, expressivity even more. So that brings up a, a, an interesting point in that as a, as a saxophonist and an instrumentalist, we practice scales and long tones and overtones and <laughs> finger patterns and stuff like this. But if you have the ability to, co to code any button to be anywhere or to do anything, then how do you think about developing a performance practice on that instrument when the instrument itself is constantly changing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, the constantly changing thing is true. And also there are periods of um, sort of uh, when the, the sort of set of sounds I'm using will congeal or, or sort of cement into a, a particular instrument that I then have practiced on and performed on for a couple months. And, you know, I'll sort of take that patch or, or what have you on the road and, and you know play some shows in Chicago and play you know go to I was in Europe last year and played some shows and like play with some a friend in California and like do this sort of you know like play with that patch and really get to know it and really figure it out and then after a little bit of that patch I might feel like oh I you know I, I really I really wish I could actually do this sound and that sound at the same time so I need to like rethink how I'm structuring the the um the controls mostly in order to be able to do that. Or I'll think like, oh man, you know, that when I was playing with, uh, you know, that percussionist, you know, she did this thing and I really would have loved to have, I really would have been loved, loved to have been able to do this processing effect. So then I'll like go create that processing effect and then fold that into the software. Um, so a lot of the sort of developments come from my own ideas about what, where it should go based on, uh, people that I play with or ideas that I have when I'm playing with them um, or, you know, I'll be in performance and feel like have the impulse to reach for some sound that isn't there because that button is in a different place in the software or something. And so I like, that's how the development really happens. Um, yeah. And as far as like practicing the instrument, uh, I, I don't, play scales. Um, I, I have a, um, you know, I don't really, I don't really have practice sessions as much as I have development sessions that turn into practice sessions. So I'll be working on incorporating that new sound module or I'll be uh, working on figuring out a new uh, mapping for a certain set of controllers onto a certain synthesizer. Um, and then I just find myself like, having fun and making sound and like playing and then 20 minutes I've gone by and I'm like, Oh yeah, I actually still need to like, you know, write that other part of the code or whatever. So, um, yeah, so those are kind of the, the practice sessions that I, uh, end up using to get comfortable with the instrument. But, but the most, most of my quote unquote practice session is, is with other players. So, um, you know, playing shows, uh, with colleagues, uh, and, and, or bringing, uh, colleagues into the studio and we'll just jam for a couple hours, you know, do some takes, record some stuff. Um, especially, I especially like doing that with people that I've never played with before, but probably have heard play. Um, and I just think like, oh man, I love their sound, you know, let's see what happens when we combine our sounds and, and, you know, setting up a gig and doing that whole thing is, a, is a whole nother sort of activity. Um, but just getting in a room together is really easy and really nice. So that, that keeps me on my toes also regarding practicing and knowing the instrument. So how much would you say, like when you're heading back to develop, like you've, you decide that you want to make some sort of change to your instrument, um, how, how much do you change at a time? And uh, is there sort of a threshold where if you change too much, it gets confusing. And then the next time you go play, it's, it's like, you don't know where to find stuff. Uh, did you, have you found your limit as to how much you can change at a time? Um, so the nice thing about the way the software is implemented is that I can have, uh, like, like kind of spaces, um, that are a little bit more set. And then if I, can hit a button and it'll take me to like a totally different space. And my MIDI controller, I should have like held it up. 
you know, I could have like a different, um, you know, these buttons all do these things. And then if I hit go to a different space, those buttons all do something totally different. And so that's nice because I can actually keep like my previous uh, space and then also have these other spaces that maybe are previous previous space or like the sort of, uh, you know, in the works of developing its space um, and be able to switch back and forth between them. So that, that's one nice thing about it is during a gig, I can sort of like be in the comfort zone and then dip into the, the new space and sort of move back and forth in a way that uh, can be really nice. Uh, but to answer your question more directly, yeah, I mean, there are times when I'll be in a show and I'm, I'm, having, to, I'm having to think a little bit harder about remembering what those sounds are, right? So this sound is under that button, this slider will bring up that effect and I have to kind of process that. Um, and then there's also, you know, once I get more comfortable with a certain setup, there comes a time when I, I'm actually not as much thinking about, you know, which button does which thing, but I, my, my hands and my body and my ears sort of know the sound that I'm looking for and it's it's that one like my thumb and my forefinger go here and I you know I grab this knob because then I can do the this or you know and um, and I'm really not thinking as much about remembering what it is but just sort of you know be, being reactive and responsive and uh, letting my letting that embodied knowledge uh, do the thing that I want it to do. So do you try to sort of organize it so it's in like if you're going on tour with a specific person or you have a, a set of shows or a series of shows do you try to keep the same I don't know what to call it setup or whatever so that by the time you're done you have a really good sense of how it went and how that's going and there is that sort of the freedom that you have by the end because you're so familiar with what you've said and then you can reevaluate or I'm just wondering how you compartmentalize the changes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, there's, um, I definitely don't make a whole new sort of sonic space for myself and then like jump on stage and like try to just knock it out. It's like not, you, I gotta like practice it. I have to learn that space. Um, and I don't tend to, I'm not like constantly wanting to make new sonic spaces um, because I'm wanting to dig into a certain place and really get to understand it. So yeah, there's usually a point when it's like, oh, I have like, you know, a little bit of time before some more gigs, like right now, right, during the uh, pandemic. So it's like, yeah, I have some time here. So this would be a good time to like be thinking about those things and working on it. But if I have a, a couple weeks or months of gigs lined up, I'm probably not gonna be spending that time to try to develop new, um, new sounds. Uh, but yeah, then, then there comes the time when it's like, oh, here's an opportunity. Let me take all those thoughts that I've been sort of collecting over the past couple of months about improvements or changes I want to make. And then I take that opportunity to implement those and try to practice around those and get some um, colleagues to come into the studio with me and play around and let me sort of try out the stuff. And then, and then I'll be feeling uh, like it's ready to go. There's also the thing about code, which is that, you know, things can break. And so when you, there's a set of gigs lined up, you don't want to start tinkering too much just in case something breaks and then you got to debug it, which is, you know, they're, they're all solvable, but it's a matter of like, oh, you know, I have a gig, gig tomorrow and now this thing is like not working. So, um, yeah, you also got to be careful of that. It sounds to me like the way that you are describing the sound worlds is maybe similar to how I would think about developing a improvisational vocabulary as an instrumentalist. Like this is your vocabulary as a laptopist, right? Do you find that, um, do you ever find it limiting when you are playing with somebody maybe for the first time where you set up your vocabulary ahead of time, your world, and then somebody starts to play and you realize pretty quickly, like, mm, this is not what I thought it was going to be. So how are you able to switch between that quickly? Or how do you deal with that when your 
sound world is kind of set up ahead of time and the input varies pretty drastically from an instrumentalist that you might be playing with. Yeah, I mean, that that's certainly happened to me. Um, the idea would be that hopefully I can and usually feel relatively successful in, in being able to um, switch modes and get sort of in a space that will be more uh, conversational and supportive of the collaborator's sound world that they're creating. Um, but I mean, sometimes it's not so easy and, and sometimes, uh, you know, there, there's the, the, like I was saying, there's the thing of like, oh, I really wish, oh, I really wish I had that, you know, oh, I could have done that, that would have been nice, you know, this. and so it's, and then, and then I'll go and, and do that. So that's, um, but, but yeah, there's that sort of iteration that it takes. Uh, yeah. There's also, I mean, I also definitely have a vocabulary that are like very much TED sounds you know, that, um, uh, yeah, that I really like and, and often go to in playing and, uh, yeah, which, which I, I, I like, I mean, I like having that, that Ted sound. That's like, yeah, I feel like that's a thing that I do and I like the way I use it. And, um, you know, it's not, other people have other sounds and like, this is the Ted sound. And I, I like that sort of part of the, um, the activity of lots of people developing, uh, you know, electronic sounds and also like improvisers developing electronic sounds is when you hear somebody having a certain sound and you're like, oh yeah, that's a so-and-so sound. And that's, I kind of think that's a fun, um, you know, part of identity in the, in the improv community. So I'm wondering, since you started off as a composer and then have veered in this direction. And uh, I'm just wondering how the two feed into each other uh, in terms of, I guess, material, but also just process in general, process of practicing improvisation versus composing and how those go together or don't for you. I know it's a pretty broad question, but. Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um... So a couple of years ago, I had this sort of realization that was that I, I actually want for my composing to sound more like my improvising, mostly like in, in timbre and like gesture, like sonic space, um, and, but also in freedom and like the sort of uh, just energy that comes from improvising that one can also compose, but for as an improviser, it, it comes in a way that is really stimulating and exciting and collaborative. Um, so, I, what I mean, I've actually started to do a lot of this, where I'll take like recordings of me improvising with somebody else, but I'll just take the TED part, not the you know the, the TED part of the recording, not the other person part of the recording, and actually fold that into the compositional process. So I'll use it as a tape part that then I'll, I'll compose for other players to play with. Um, or, you know, I'll take like just little sounds like this, this, you know, like, oh, that's a good sound. Let me like take that that I created while improvising and, and use it in this comp in this tape part composition. Or even like, I'll, in, or I'll transcribe the improvisation. So for, um, you know, even if it's just electronic sounds in the improvisation, I will sort of transcribe that for acoustic players to play because for me that helps capture the energy and the sort of immediacy, the gestural nature of it, the timbral nature of it. You know, that's an interesting um, translation I've been doing a lot the last couple of years is like tra translating this electronics tape part for an acoustic player that then they usually are playing alongside with in this sort of relation between those two sounds happening at the same time. Um, yeah, so the thing about composing though that's really valuable is that it gives me much more control over the form, right? So when improvising, we create form uh, and, and oftentimes that form is sort of emerging um, and being sort of led and followed in various ways. And, and the thing that, about composing that I like is it's 
much more possible to really decide exactly what this form is going to be and wh how how that's going to happen and why that's going to happen and then make really strong formal juxtapositions um, which uh, is harder to do when improvising. So that's sort of the the the, two, the main differences between those practices for me. Um, yeah, the, the other thing about that is that I I don't um, being an electronics improviser has actually led me further away from using live processing in a compositional setting because if something is supposed to happen the same every time, like uh, like a composition, then you know it can just be in a tape part and it doesn't have to be live un unless there's some sort of improvisation or stochastic or aleatoric sort of elements in the composition itself, right? In which case it is improvisatory. But um, yeah, so for composing, I've really started to just focus on making tape parts. And for, but for improvising, I mean, there it's essential that it be live because we are live. And that is for me much more exciting. Um, so that's another result of being an improviser that's changed my compositional process. Uh, yeah. So would you say that your your compositional language has maybe been more established or has solidified more since you've become an improvising performer? Like, I just wonder Sorry. if that's... You broke up. Say it again. Oh, okay. I'm just wondering if... Uh, improvise or your if your compositional process ha, or language sorry not process if your compositional language has solidified or been maybe more established since you've been an improvising performer if that's led you in a certain path that you feel like okay this is really my voice and composition or i'm definitely on the right track that's more authentic to what i want to do Whereas before, if you were more exploring and trying to figure that out, I'm just wondering if improvising helped you figure that out. Yeah, I would say absolutely. That I, it, it more feels like my voice. And in some ways, I feel like I found that vocabulary through improvising and now feel more, um, yeah, that, that the voice is more authentic in my composing also. Uh, yeah, I will also add that the, the sort of, um, you know, the, 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 the line between the two has blurred for me, right? So it's less like, oh, my this voice and my that voice. It's like all one voice, uh, which has just sort of become more clear. Um, of course, in like 10 years, I'll watch this and be like, what was that? That wasn't your voice. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the line has blurred, so which is kind of nice. And, and I've started to feel... Uh, that sort of compositional voice in some ways feels even more authentic or I think the, like the process feels more authentic when doing things that are a, a mixture of the two. So like these structured improvisations um, that are developed with, with collaborators, you know, so we have, it's like, it's a piece, it's composed, but there's not, a, there's not a sheet of paper involved and though we're performing the, the piece. Uh, there's often other uh, organizing structures involved about like, you know, certain tape parts or like multimedia pr presentation parts that happen. Um, and obviously a form in our mind about what is going to happen. Uh, but those things have, have even started to feel more authentic that like very, very mixture of the two in a collaborative setting. Um, like this uh, performance that Binary Canary did a couple, almost a year ago at um, Constellation for our album release show. Uh, and, and, you know, it was like an hour long set of pieces and it felt very structured. It was very improvised, but certainly, uh, yeah, that was like a... And this other piece too I have with uh, this bassoonist Ben Royal Ward, who, who that is like um, about 20 minutes long structured improvisation with lights and tape and feedback and all this stuff. And that, that, that also is another one that feels very authentic. Uh, let me ask you about the lights and the, and the feedback and the video 
stuff. I mean, we have we did a lot of that in that show with Binary Canary. We've done a lot of that in other pieces. You just say you do some of that with Ben. How does that extra element influence or engage with the improvisation or the way that you think about it? Or how do you control those elements in an improvisation? Like, are the lights improvising? Yeah, I mean, that's a good... Um... So that's, that's like kind of where a lot of my thinking and like research is happening right now is about that integration with improvisation specifically. Um, I, when, when composing a piece, like really just composing, I, I often find it uh, more compelling to include those elements because again, I can sort of control the form really precisely when something happens happens or you know how the lights are responding or, or how the lights are um, in coordination with or not in coordination with the sounds that are coming off the stage um, and when improvising it's harder to sort of predict and know with those things so I, I think I do feel that it is more successful or or I feel more confident maybe I should say when composing a piece for performers that are going to perform the piece to include those multimedia elements. The problem with that is that, you know, you can't always expect an ensemble to like haul a bunch of DMX lighting instruments to Europe for their tour, right? It's just like, that is not um, very common or uh, gonna happen. Although I, I, the, 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 there, there's a percussion trio in Texas named Line Upon Line that did do that to play in my piece. So they like shipped their I don't know, brought them on the plane, uh, which was kind of crazy and awesome. Um, so when improvising, I mean, it's harder to sort of, you know, predict or know when you're going to want certain media elements to be present. Um, so, so part of the research I'm doing now is also includes uh, using, again, these machine learning tools or other tools to try to integrate those media elements in ways that feel, um, you know, compelling to me or feel strong, feel, uh, you know, important and sort of thought through um, as opposed to maybe, you know, there's some sounds happening and there's a 20 minute performance and the lights are just sort of like doing a thing that's kind of the same for 20 minutes and you're like, oh, you know, is that element of the performance going to have development, right? Or are the lights just going to stay in their sort of flickery sonic reactivity um, for the whole time? Because to me, that's not as interesting as giving that element of performance, the multimedia element, some sort of development, motivic development or formal development. Um, I think that's important. So trying to figure out ways and tools that, that those multimedia elements can intelligently track the motivic and formal developments happening in the sound so that we also get that in the multimedia. What are some of those ways? Well, um, so, so one, one thing that we did actually in that, uh, 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 the, the constellation show was that I had a, a neural network that was listening to the incoming sound signal from my no input mixer and um, and then being able to identify classify what kinds of sounds that no input mixer was making in, in the moment and then use that classification to determine uh, how the sort of um, sound to light parameter mappings uh, should be connected. So if the no input, make, no input mixer is making a high squealy sound, then like, you know, take these sonic parameters and map them to these lighting parameters. Or if the no input mixer is making a just a noise sound, in that case, take these sonic parameters from the audio analysis and map them to these lighting parameters to create the light. So, you know, that way it's sort of um, the sound to light relation is, a, is more uh, um, sort of comp complicated in a way that is less Mickey mousing, just like 
you know, when the pitch goes up, the light gets blue or whatever. There's a little bit more complexity there, which I think is really important in the uh, like perception of those streams of information being the sound and the light and our brains sort of being tickled by those relations. I think the, uh, an appropriate amount of complexity is, is really valuable there. Um, and then another, so that's one example of how to sort of make those relations more, um, more compelling. Uh, on a different scale, one thing I've been working on recently is using um, a k-means classifier, or which is the type of algorithm, or another one called a Gaussian mixture model. And what these do is they can take a big set of data and sort of identify where there are clusters in that data. And so the way this might be used is have the, I could have the algorithm like listen to the audio that's happening in real time during improvisation from the acoustic performer, from me, just sort of listen to all that data. And every so often sort of like look at that data and be like, huh, how is this structured? Like, oh, it seems like there's a lot of data points over here, which might be like a sonic space that we're, that we're um, participating in or that we're making. And it seems like there's some, another like cluster over here, which might be another sonic space that we're creating. And then if the algorithm says like, okay, well now you're like over here, like this is something that really isn't related to the other stuff, that, that might be a cue to the algorithm to say, oh, it seems like they've, that the performance has shifted into a new, or really a new sonic space, and therefore the algorithm can make a choice about shifting some parameter like of how the multimedia is presented. Like for example, you know, the lights turn off and the video comes on, and like that is a thing that the algorithm can sort of do um, on its own. These sort of like larger formal multimedia relationships um, that would be perceived by, or the, the changes would be perceived by the algorithm, and then those changes could be manifested in the, the multimedia. So that's, that's an example that I've been playing around with and sort of working on uh, creating in this quarantine time. So for a year, maybe two years, you had this series that you were doing in Minneapolis and St. Paul with Scott Miller called Ars Electroacoustica. Is that right? Yeah. How do you think about playing with another laptopist or another you know, electronic performer as opposed to an instrumentalist. Like, you wouldn't have the same kind of input coming into your system, right? Because everything would be created electronically. So how do you adjust um, for that kind of thing? Um, yeah. Um, so one nice thing about the uh, Ars Electroacoustica series was that we had a different acoustic performer come in for every show and then Scott and I would play with them and um, that was nice because we got I, I, I got to practice playing with all sorts of different styles of improvisation and uh, you know instruments which are can be very can very much change the way I think about the um, what sonic spaces to be in and what sort of processing are, are appropriate or useful for different instruments um, I don't think I ever had Scott's output coming into my processing, though. We didn't do that sort of like cross processing thing. I have done that with um, Weston Lanky a couple times. Uh, and that's, a, that's like another kind of mind trip of like where sounds are coming from. Um, but one thing about playing with another, another electronic musician is there are times when, you know, I actually won't know if that sound I'm hearing is coming from me or coming from Scott. And so there's a, a sense of like, there's a, it's, it's like an interesting kind of ear training to really get to know sort of what sounds could come out of my software given various combinations and sort of keeping track of where I am in the software and you know, if that sound is mine or not. And then also getting to know other people's sounds and like, oh, that, that's a Scott sound. I know that right away or you know, this sort of thing. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Does that answer your question? It, it does. So playing with a laptop, playing with somebody else on a laptop, lighting equipment, video, feeding back systems. <laughs> does does your computer ever fry <laughs> like overload completely in the process of having all of these things running at the same time? Um, ra rarely, it rarely does. Um, uh, yeah, it's usually, it's, it's usually okay. The, the, the constellation show, which I keep mentioning, it was also, oh, yeah. um, you know, we, we had to, uh, reduce some of the computational power, before the show just to make sure that because the computer was getting really hot um, and getting a little grumpy. So I just had to like go into the code and be like, okay, that thing I was going to have you do, like do this other stuff, but like just ignore that one because that seems to be upsetting you. So there are times when that happens, but I mean, that's, you know, this is a uh, um, sort of how things go. I like to say that, you know, a saxophonist has had a read break, you know, but right before a show or on stage or whatever. And so you just got to know, you just got, you just got to know your instrument and know what to do. Um, and sometimes that means like just sort of waving your hand and like make, you know, going to this other thing. And then we're just going to not go over to that place that wasn't feeling good or, or, you know, sometimes the read snaps in half and you just have to be like, we're going to gotta get another read, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, that rarely happens. And I usually I chalk that up to uh, practice, you know, just practicing with the instrument means you know it well. Um, it means that you have sort of practiced enough that you've been, you've engaged with all of those potential uh, issues. And so you have, you know, as you engage with a potential issue, you solve that issue so it won't happen again, right? And that's sort of what that practice leads to. So I actually, I, I'm, I'll eat these words, I'm sure, but I, I have a some pride in the uh, um, smoothness with which my electronics tend to tend to go. The other thing about all the, the, the complexity of it all, the video, the lights, the computer, the, the feedback things, they're like, for me, that's all, it's like, it's all, that's like, that's like how I like to think about making work in the complexity of all of that. And that in that complexity, there is the, you know, it's like chaos and like nonlinear systems, right? Small changes can lead to big differences. And so you get this complex system. And oftentimes when composing or, or planning a, you know, a show or, or building the instrument, I like, like to build these complex systems that I'm not quite sure how they're going to behave. And then that surprise is really exciting and, and stimulating to me to be, to then explore as an improviser, um, you know, or, or, or to, or for me to like watch as an audience member, that there's like a level of sort of complexity that I, I, I can't quite keep track of every detail that's happening, but it's like this system that's producing all this variation and this intensity. And that is um, very much in my thinking of how I sort of design these systems and design these performances or, or compositions, even sometimes when composing, just not even like being on stage, but planning, uh, you know, the, how the piece will work. I develop these complex systems that then will like generate a lot of material out of their complexity. And then I select from that material, the parts I like the best and put them into the piece. Right. So that sort of thinking is really, um, embedded in how I do a lot of my creative work. Does it ever happen that you're make producing some sort of sounds and they are so complex or you don't really know what the combination of things create or what combination of things created that sound if you wanted to come back to it? Or when, when stuff happens, you generally know how you got to that point. So you can reproduce it if you want to. Well, there are some uh, there are some cases where I, I definitely don't know, and that's because I, I also, especially when I'm like generating material, I'll use randomness. So I'll just like randomize some parameters, and then if it sounds good, you know, hit record, and if it doesn't, don't or whatever. 
Um, in which case, I definitely don't know what the parameters are, right? So I couldn't recreate it if I wanted to. I mean, you know, I could use my ears to orally analyze the sound and try to recreate it, but it's not going to be that thing. Um, in, in my software, that happens less because it's a little bit more controlled. The randomness is a little bit less present in that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stochastic things in it, but they're sort of, they're stochastic, right? So there's still like a middle of the bell curve of sort of what the sound is. And then there's this sort of like variations that happen around that. Um, when I'm playing like a, a no input mixer or my Bureau rack synthesizer, there's a lot more nonlinearity in that, a lot more feedback of signals. And so it is much less predictable. Um, there, there's still elements that can be controlled, but it's it's less predictable. But I, again, I find that really exciting. It's like a it's like a um, a third improvise or you know additional improviser on stage that's like sort of making decisions, and then I am re reacting to those decisions uh, as are the others that are listening. And so. And that to me is, yeah, it's like really exciting to sort of be riding that wave of like what's happening and like keeping up and, you know, res responding and trying to fight with sometimes a certain sound to get it to be somewhere else. And all of that is like really exciting for me to do live in performance. Okay, so I'm wondering what your, or who are your major musical and artistic influences or non-musical and artistic influences that influence your artistry? Yeah, um, well, I just, I watched the um, interview you guys did with Dana and I, I'll, I will echo her in saying that what's most exciting to me is usually like uh, working with collaborators or like seeing what my peers are doing. Um, yeah, I mean, I just find that to be like the most exciting thing. Like, I, you know, I love just going to shows and like being in Chicago and there's a lot of shows and being able to just go hear shows and like, I don't know who those people are, but let's go see what's up and, you know, or I go to see my colleague play and uh, there's some other act and I feel like, oh, wow, that was crazy. I got to go investigate that more. So that's usually what's most exciting to me. Um, I mean, my first, like I said, the, the thing that got me interested in improvising was watching Sam and Peter play, um, which has still remained uh, an influence, I would say. Um, yeah, I mean, lately I've been uh, sort of doing some listening with the quarantine. I discovered uh, um, Elizabeth Baker's music, and I've been really enjoying listening to that. Um, some really great, like, electronic sound world that she's making in there. Uh, I got back into Ikwe Mori a little bit and, like, um, her improvs and, like, the stuff she did with John Zorn and trying to catch up on all that listening. Um, also, like, uh, Japanese noise artists like Mertzbao or Haji Kaden are, like, influences to me that sort of like raw energy and expression and like timbral um noisiness i guess or edginess uh you know something i find really inspiring and really like to to go listen to um yeah I, those are some answers what are you working on right now well um right now i am finishing up uh, an album that's coming out in two months. That's me with some other improvisers. It has um, uh, Jenna Lyle, Ben Reutel Ward, Jung Tuan Ku, who's a, a percussionist in, who lives in Amsterdam, um, uh, Emerson Hutton, who's a drummer, and um, Eric Krauss, who's a pianist. We have a trio track on the album. Uh, Flutist Anne LaBerge and saxophonist Tom Weeks. So it's like a sort of a TED album with many collaborators on these tracks and they're all in, improvisations. Um, and that'll be coming out on Carrier in about two months. Uh, and then also I just finished up um, 
uh, or this summer I wrote a piece for this uh, piano duo named called Hockett Duo. I think they're based in LA. And they did this uh, What 2020 Sounds Like project. So they commissioned a whole bunch of short pieces. And I wrote them a 90 second uh, piano four hands plus tape piece. And, uh, and then right now I'm in the process of writing a piece for Jack Quartet and tape that is part of the National Sawdust Digital Festival commissioning series. Cool. Yeah. Those are uh, all fun projects. Yeah. What else is on your mind? Anything else? That's kind of all, all I have for you today. I don't know. Maybe that's all I have for you today. That was a lot. <laughs> I, it's, yeah, it's just remarkable to me, this idea of building your own instrument and having this randomness, but also the control and having it all. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> it's, it's very fun. It keeps me very busy. Guys, as fun things should. Yeah. I mean, I love the saxophone, so. Uh, me too. I plan to stick with it. But. Some days. Not, not in my mouth. I, I like it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Ted, for your Thank time. Thank you, guys. And... Thanks for doing this. I'm looking forward to, you know, hearing, hearing all these. Yeah, thanks, man. Cool. All right. Nice to see you both. Mm -hmm. You too. Talk soon. See ya. Bye.